Okay, uh, welcome to lecture here. Uh, we'll get started in just a second. And again, we'll be uh, continuing on on chapter two, I believe. And again, as you're doing there, if you could put it in the uh, chat box here for roll, that'd be great. Thank you. Everybody, a minute here to get in. <clears throat> so again, uh, we're uh, continuing on chapter two here. Uh, chapter three notes are up there as well. Um, I'm not sure we'll actually get to chapter three today, but probably on Wednesday we'll get to chapter three. Uh, we still have a little bit more here to go in this chapter, but you never know. Okay, so uh, we're going to. Uh, <clears throat> Continue on with chapter two, and like normal, if you do have any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, again, you could chat them in the chat box if you like. If you want to use your uh, microphone, you're welcome to do that as well. Right now, everybody's muted, but again, you could do it either way, and I'll be happy to answer your questions if you have them as we go through. So last time we sort of talked about the atom here in uh, chapter two, uh, we talked about the structure of the atom, and again, a reminder that uh, ultimately there are some experiments, but sort of the end result of the atom, I guess is the way to put it, or sort of the modern version of the atom was one that was basically discovered after Rutherford did his experiment. And essentially it is thought of as being mostly empty space, the atom. Um, and in the center of the atom is a dense positive core, which is the nucleus. And inside the nucleus, we have our protons, which are positively charged. Uh, later, it was also found that inside the nucleus as well, is where our neutrons are and they have no charge. And in that sort of empty space out from the nucleus at some point is where we have our electrons basically traveling around. And again, as we talked about last time, um, they really don't travel electrons in pretty little circles. They do travel pretty randomly about the nucleus. And there is that sort of opposites attract uh, and that idea in chemistry, which is uh, was also sometimes referred to as electrostatic attraction. And it basically is that, uh, so things with positive charge and things with negative charges, uh, they are attracted to each other and things that have the same type of charge are repelled by each other. They don't really like to be around each other. And uh, with those negatively charged electrons flying around on the outside, uh, there is some attraction between those electrons and the nucleus. And as we'll talk about in a next chapter, when we talk about bonding, uh, it results in certain electrons being involved in bonding and certain ones not being involved in bonding. Uh, then we talked about the idea of atomic number. Atomic number is the number of protons that you can find in an atom of an element. It is uh, the number that you do find on the periodic table. So again, uh, when you look at a periodic table and you do see the symbol, that number that is typically above the symbol is the atomic number. And the definition of atomic number is the number of protons there are in an atom. And again, if the atom happens to be neutral, that means that the number of electrons would also be the same. But remember, as we talked about last time, the actual definition of atomic number is just the number of protons or positively charged guys. We also talked about the mass number. The mass number is the number of protons and the number of neutrons that there are in an atom. And that number is not found on the periodic table. So as we talked about last time, although many people do believe it is this number on the bottom, it is not that number on the bottom. Uh, that is, as we talked about last time, we'll talk a little bit about today as well. Uh, that is what is known as the atomic mass for an element. Uh, so not the mass number. And the way you can remember that is, as we talked about last time, uh, pretty much when you calculate either protons, uh, electrons, or neutrons, how many there are, are the atomic number, are the mass number, they all should be positive whole numbers. And again, if you look on the periodic table underneath all the symbols, pretty much none of those numbers are whole numbers. They're all some type of decimal number or something like that. And again, those numbers on the bottom of the symbol is the atomic mass and not the mass number. 
So uh, the other important thing that we talk about in terms of the atomic number are the number of protons that you can also see if you look at the periodic table is that all the numbers on top of the symbols, if you look at the periodic table, you will never find the number that repeats. And what that means is the atomic number are the number of protons, which is essentially the same thing, basically will tell you what element you are talking about. So you can figure out what element it is solely based on the number of protons or its atomic number, which again is the same thing. Um, we also finished up here talking about isotopes. Isotopes are the same element, but they have different masses. <clears throat> and the reason they have different masses is because they have a different numbers of neutrons. So they are the same elements, so they would have the same number of uh, protons, but they would have different numbers of neutrons in that case. And the important thing is we can write sort of the symbol for these guys, like we talked about at the very end, where we take the symbol, like we see down here, and to the top left of the symbol is where we put the mass number, which is our protons and neutrons. To the bottom left is where we put our atomic number, which is our number of uh, neutrons. So we did uh, three sort of examples here with hydrogen. Again, although they all have here, as we talked about last time, different sort of names, they are all the same element. They're all hydrogen because they all pretty much have one proton for each of them. And again, if you go to periodic table and look at number one, number one is H, which is hydrogen. That's how we know the symbol. And top left here is our mass number. So for the case of hydrogen, one proton, no neutrons, gives us one for the mass number. For deuterium, one proton, one neutron gives us two for the mass number on top. And one proton and two neutrons gives us three for the mass number for our tritium. Again, all really hydrogen, uh, sort of heavy hydrogen, radioactive version of hydrogen. And they're all definitely hydrogen because they all have one uh, proton or one for the atomic number. Every element will have protons, electrons, and neutrons. The only exception is what we see on the screen there. It is actually hydrogen. Hydrogen only has a proton and it has an electron. It does not have a neutron. And again, everybody else will have all three of those. Any questions on any of that there? Okay, so I think this is sort of uh, where we left off. So why don't you take a couple of minutes here and what we're looking to do for each of these is figure out the number of protons, electrons, and neutrons in each of them. So take a couple of minutes here and figure out that for each of them. And then we'll talk about how you did and see how you're doing. Okay, so let's take a look and see how we're doing. So we'll start with the first one here. Uh, CO is cobalt. And again, remember that our top number here is the mass number. Bottom number here is our atomic number. And remember, it's the atomic number that tells us that number of protons. 
So we know that the number of protons for our top guy here should be 27, as that's the atomic number. We also know that this guy does not have a charge, and how you know it doesn't have a charge is because if it did, something would be written right about there, and we don't see any positives, we don't see any negative type things written there, so we could assume that it is neutral, which means because it has 27 positive guys, which are our protons, it should also have 27 negative guys, which is our electrons, to balance it out. Remember that protons are positively charged, electrons are negatively charged, and neutrons have no charge. So really, you know, the only things that could affect the charge, obviously, is the protons are the electrons. Now for our number of uh, neutrons, we want to take our mass number minus our atomic number. And again, in this case, it would be 60 minus 27. Again, our mass number is the number of protons and neutrons there are. So when we subtract that, it's a lot of mass. I can go with 33 for our neutrons there. So we should have uh, 33 neutrons in this case, 27 protons and 27 electrons. Any questions on that particular one there? All right, looking at the next one here, same approach, bottom numbers are atomic number. We do not see any charge, so that tells us that the number of protons for sure is 17. Again, because we don't have any charges, the number of electrons should balance that out with 17 as well. Again, 17 positives, 17 negatives, no charge overall. And again, our mass number, which is essentially top number minus bottom number, uh, so the number of neutrons would be mass number, which is 37, minus 17, which is our protons. And that looks like a 20 for our neutrons in that particular case. And lastly, we have U here, which is uranium. Again, bottom number, which is our atomic number. So our number of protons is going to be 92. Again, no charge here. So our number of electrons need to match to balance everything out, which would be 92. And our number of neutrons in this case, a lot, I think. So that is 238, which is our mass number, minus 92, 146-ish there we'll go with in terms of the number of neutrons. Any questions on any of those there? <clears throat> All right. So I think a few more examples here to work on and see. So why don't you try the next ones that are there. And in this case, we want to write the symbols with the mass number and atomic number for each of these. And again, may require you to look at a periodic table. So hopefully got one somewhere there near you. Let's see what you come up with. So we're looking for the symbol with the included mass number and atomic number in the right spots uh, for each of these that are here. Sure. Yeah, uh, so technically, even though, uh, to answer your question about that, um, yeah, even though I didn't write it, uh, you actually don't need to write it if you're just asked um, uh, how many electrons or protons there are. I just write it so you can kind of visually kind of tie together that, again, these 92 guys are positive, these 92 guys are negative, so that it will balance each other out. Uh, you don't actually have to write it in a question like this if you're asked um, how many... Um, protons, electrons, or neutrons there are, you could just write 92, which would be the correct answer. Uh, but they are 92 positive guys, which are protons, 92 negative guys, which are electrons. But you actually don't actually need to put the positive or negative when you're just answering a question about how many there are of each of those. Uh, but if you're asked, obviously, what the charge of each of those guys were, protons or electrons, it would be positive or negative.
Okay, so let's take a look at this one. So again, obviously when you're doing these type of problems, a periodic table would be obviously very helpful for you. And by the way, in case you don't have one tonight, a periodic table will be helpful for you probably for the next several lectures. Uh, so you have something to refer to. So again, you may wanna find one. Uh, if I remember, maybe I'll just post one up on Canvas in case you don't have one, but probably in one of your books, you should hopefully have a periodic table. But it may be very helpful uh, today's lecture, next couple of lectures or two or three lectures. Uh, to have a, a periodic table near you so you could kind of reference it as well. Um, so Krypton has a, a 48 neutrons. So the first thing you would want to do is go to the periodic table and find the symbol for Krypton and Krypton is 36 and it is KR is the symbol. The number that we can get from the periodic table again when you look at it is it is number 36, and that is the atomic number, which means that really is the number of protons that there are, right? And in terms of the atomic number, it does go bottom left there of the periodic table, uh, not periodic, it's bottom left of the symbol that you got there. Now that we know that this is the number of protons, we do know that the mass number, which goes on top left, is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So we know 36 protons from the periodic table. We also know 48 neutrons from the actual problem given to us. So if we add those guys together, I think that's 84 there, if I'm not mistaken. And we will end up with 84 for our mass number. And again, in terms of symbol, top left is where we should put our mass number. Again, in this case, uh, you could pretty safely assume that it's neutral, unless it would have told you something, but it definitely is going to be neutral. Uh, so in this case, we would know 36 protons, 36 electrons, and our 48 neutrons. Any questions on that particular one there? Now here for the next one, nitrogen. So again, going to the periodic table, nitrogen is N, is the symbol. The number that we could also see from the periodic table is above nitrogen is seven, which would be its atomic number. And again, that would tell us the number of protons that there are. And it would also go bottom left of the symbol there for our nitrogen. And now that we know the number of protons is seven, again, six given to us, which is the number of neutrons. If we add those together, that looks like 13 and that would be our mass number that would go on top. You will actually, for any type of uh, exam or quiz, you will be given a periodic table if you need it. So one would be provided for you uh, that you should use. So don't use any other one, but it, it definitely will be provided for you a periodic table for sure. I'm just saying during lecture as well, you, you may need some type of periodic table to help you kind of look through some stuff, obviously. Uh, so that would be our symbol here. And lastly here, iron, which is Fe on the periodic table. So the symbol for iron is Fe. If we look on the periodic table where Fe is, it is 26. Uh, so 26 would again be our atomic number. Also the number of protons. So 26 bottom left. It gave us the mass number in this particular case, which is 56. So that is not just the neutrons, but that actually is the mass number, uh, which would give us uh, 56 on the top left. That would be the correct symbol. Here we are looking for the number of protons, electrons, and neutrons. So again, uh, the atomic number, which is 26, would tell us the number of protons would be 26. Same idea as before, because this is neutral, no charge. We assume that the number of positive 26 should balance out the number of negative guys. So we would also have 26 electrons in this particular case. And lastly, our number of neutrons going to be mass number minus atomic number. Uh, so that's going to give us 56 minus 26, which would give us 30 for the number of neutrons. Any questions on any of those there? Now, you may ask yourself, what happens if something does have a charge, for example? So all these guys uh, were neutral. Let me see where I got the right one. All these guys were neutral, uh, which means they had no charge. So as we talked about, the number of protons and the number of electrons would balance them, each other out. 
But what would happen in the case of something with a charge? So why don't we, since we're here, just talk a little bit about that and we'll just figure out where I want to write that. Let's go maybe, actually right there. I'm just gonna get rid of some of these guys actually. So, <clears throat> so let's say we have something with a charge and things with charges, things with charges are what are known as uh, ions. So ions are, Ions are uh, charge entities. And there's really two types of ions that we'll talk about in this chapter and in the next chapter really a lot more. And one are known as cations and cations are positively charged ions. And there's also anions, which are negatively charged guys. So we have cations which are positively charged. We have anions which are negatively charged. And you may say to yourself, so what happens if something does have a charge? So why don't we take this guy here that we just did, which is nitrogen. And again, in this nitrogen, as we saw to the right there, just to reiterate what we had there, it had, in terms of protons, it had seven protons. It also had seven electrons, and our neutrons that we had uh, was six in terms of those guys. So if we take this nitrogen, same setup here, we go 13, seven, and nitrogen, and now give it a minus three charge. So let's say this nitrogen had a minus three charge. What would that affect? So the one thing that we know for sure is this, we know for sure that out of protons, electrons, and neutrons, the one that is the most important in terms of determining what element it is, is hopefully you remember it is the protons. Again, the atomic number, when you look on the periodic table, every element has its own atomic number. So it is the number of protons that determine the element we're talking about. So that's why this guy is nitrogen here. This guy is nitrogen here, and what we see is the atomic number obviously is the same because if we change the atomic number, it no longer would be nitrogen, it would be some other element. So in this particular case here, we would know that in terms of protons, it would have seven protons because the atomic number here is still seven. By the way, the number of neutrons here would also be the same as what we had below, 13 minus seven, which would give us six. So what we can clearly see here, hopefully, is the protons gotta stay the same because it's the same element. The number of neutrons in this particular case does stay the same. So it is actually the number of electrons that change. And in this case, we have an overall charge of negative three. So the number of electrons that we should have is actually going to be 10 electrons. If you take 10 negative guys and you add them to seven positive guys, that leaves you a minus three overall. And that is where the charge comes from because it has basically three more electrons. So anions, as we see here, they gain electrons. And you can see that if you compare the electrons and the guy with the charge to the electrons and the neutral guy, it went from seven electrons to 10 electrons when it gained a charge. So it gained electrons. And that's always how anions are made. They typically gain electrons. And basically what that means is they have more negative charges than positive charges that are found in the protons. And that's why overall they end up with a negative charge. You may also notice if you count the difference between the neutral guy and our guy with a minus three charge is three electrons. So the number for the charge tells you how many electrons. The negative part here tells you that it gained electrons from the neutral atom. So the actual charge that you see on something actually tells you how many electrons are involved. In this case, how many electrons are involved in the gaining of those electrons? 
Now let's see what happens though if we do have a positive guy. So let's take a look at this guy down here. Erase a little bit of something so I got somewhere to write. Okay. Now let's take this same iron, 56 and 26, and let's actually give it a plus two charge. So this iron has a plus two charge. Same thing here, our atomic number is going to be the same because it is 26 and it is iron, which means this guy here has, in terms of protons, 26 protons. In terms of neutrons in this case, 56 minus 26 will still give us 30 in terms of our neutrons. And the same deal here is electrons are actually going to be what is different. In this particular case, he needs 24 electrons. 24 negatives plus 26 positives leaves you a plus two left over. And it has a plus two charge. Now, when you compare the electrons in the guy with a charge to the electrons in the one with no charge, we see that the difference here is it actually lost electrons. And that's how we make something that's positively charged. We lose electrons. And when we lose electrons, we now have more protons, which are positive, than electrons, which are negative, And that gives us a positive charge. You will also see the exact same thing we saw above. The charge here is two. And the difference between electrons, between the neutral guy and the one with the charge is also two. So same thing here, the two tells us two electrons are involved. The positive charge tells us that it is lost two electrons. Any questions on what to do with something with a charge? I'll give you one to try here. Why don't you do, why don't you do this one here, 60, 27, cobalt with a plus four charge. How many protons, how many electrons, and how many neutrons are there in this guy? So take a second and see what you come up with. Okay, good, I'm seeing some answers come through. So let's see how you did, it's looking good, I think. So uh, protons again, because this is our atomic number, which is the number of protons, would tell us we have 27 positive guys. Uh, in this particular case, it does have a plus four charge. Again, the plus means that it lost electrons. Four means that it lost four electrons from its neutral. So it does look right up there, 23 negatives. Again, 27 positives, if you add that together with our 23 negatives, leaves us a plus four left over, and that is where the charge comes from. And again, our neutrons would be 60 minus 27, and that looks like it is 33. So looking good there in the chat box, very good. Any questions on how to calculate protons, electrons, neutrons? Both neutral are things with charges. So as we talked about, the nice thing about isotopes is uh, they are the same element. Uh, and again, um, because they have the same number of protons, and the nice thing about that is in normal chemical reactions, uh, neutrons really don't take part, or protons really. And that means that you know they will have the same sort of 
uh, characteristics or properties of each other. And sometimes people will use radioactive versions of, of elements to follow what's happening, uh, say in a reaction or something like that, because it will perform basically the same chemistry involved. You could use the fact that it's radioactive to really keep track of where it's going and what's happening with it. So it's very common people will use something like radioactivity to do that. So the next thing we're gonna talk about now is actually the, the number that you do see on the periodic table. So again, uh, if you look on that periodic table, and as we talked about this number down here, which is not the mass number, it is actually the atomic mass of the particular element. So let's talk about that guy and sort of how we calculate atomic mass and what's sort of done with that. And one of the fundamental properties, obviously, of an atom is its mass. But as we talked about, mass are the atom is extremely small, which means you can't just pick one up and put it on a scale or something like that to weigh it. Um, so obviously, if you can't do that, in a lot of times in chemistry, what oftentimes people will do is they will pick something to use as sort of a standard. And they'll pick something as a standard to compare to. And in the case of atomic mass, they took an isotope of carbon. They took the carbon-12 isotope as the standard used to figure out the atomic mass of everybody. And the atomic uh, carbon-12 isotope has a mass of 12 AMU, as we will see. AMU is atomic mass units. It is essentially the units that you can use off the periodic table. After this, not so much will we see AMU used a lot, but we'll use grams per mole, but it is essentially what the units are. So basically they use this carbon-12 isotope as sort of a standard. And what they did is they said, well, they took something like hydrogen, for example, and said hydrogen is only about 8.4% as massive as this carbon-12 isotope. So they basically just did a calculation, if you will. This is 8.4% converted into a decimal. So if you take 8.4% and you divide it by 100, you're basically going to move the decimal two places to the left. And that's how we get that 0.8400 as a decimal. Um, similar calculations were done for oxygen, which is 16, iron, which is 5585. Again, if you look on the periodic table, those are the numbers that you will see under those elements, like I just mentioned. You know, if you had iron, you'll see 5585 and 26 up on top. Now, as you can see in this example, this example, and a bunch of these other examples here, typically speaking, when you go to the periodic table and you take that number that's on the bottom, we typically do round to about four significant figures. So usually we go to about four sig figs when we pull that number off of the periodic table. So for example, the uh, periodic table I have in front of me for something like oxygen, it says something like 15.99, a uh, couple more nines and four. And depending on your periodic table, you may see a bunch of numbers underneath the symbol. Um, a lot of periodic tables sometimes won't round a lot. They'll give you a lot of numbers, but it's typical that we pull off about four significant figures, which is why for oxygen, we would round to 16.00, which is four significant figures. Also why for something like hydrogen uh, is typically rounded to 1.008, which is four significant figures when you pull it off there. Technically speaking, when you pull that number off, that is how much AMU there is in an atom. So basically you could say for oxygen, there's 16.00 AMU per atom as the atomic mass that you could come off of that periodic table. Now you may say, well, carbon 12 is our standard isotope. It has a mass of exactly 12 AMU. But if you look at carbon on the periodic table, when you look underneath carbon, it will say 12.01. So it says 12.01, and you may say to yourself, well, if we use carbon 12, which has a mass of 12, why does it say 12.01 when we look at something like carbon? And the reason is when you look at the periodic table, all the numbers that you see on the bottom 
of the symbols. They are atomic masses, but they are actually what are referred to as average atomic masses. Although most people don't use the word average with them. But they're basically average atomic masses of all the naturally occurring isotopes for that particular element. So something like carbon, there's the carbon-12 isotope, and there's also the carbon-13 isotope that occurs uh, naturally, and it has a mass of about 13. And that's why when we see those numbers, they technically are average atomic masses of, of uh, those particular elements. And the way that we typically can calculate the atomic mass of an element is the atomic mass of an element is the percent abundance of that particular isotope times the atomic mass of that isotope plus the percent abundance of the next isotope times the atomic mass of that isotope. plus that whole pattern just continuing. You have three isotopes, you continue that. And what that means is because they're naturally occurring isotopes, uh, they do occur in different percentages. So for example, one of the isotopes of carbon occurs about 98% of the time, 99% of the time almost. And the other isotope occurs about 1% of the time. And those would be what is sometimes referred to as percent abundance or relative abundance of those isotopes. And we can calculate the atomic mass by doing that. So for example, here, this is our carbon-12 isotope that has a mass of 12 AMU. It occurs about 98.97% of the time. That is the isotope of carbon that shows up. This is our carbon-13 isotope, which has a mass of 13.003 and occurs 1.11% of the time. So if we want to calculate the atomic mass based on this information that's given to us, the first thing you would probably want to do is add up the percentages. And when you add up these percentages, you're looking for something near 100%. And if you add up the percentages really quickly and kind of do it, and you have near 100%, what that would tell you is you have all of the naturally occurring isotopes, for example, of carbon here. If I added up these percentages and it does come to about 100, it may come a little over 100, it may come a little less than 100, but it should be right around that 100% sort of ballpark. If I were to add up these percentages here and I got only 50%, that would tell me that there is 50% something else that's carbon that should be there as well. There's another isotope, maybe another two isotopes that are there. But here, because we do add it up, it comes to about 100%. We do know that that is essentially all the naturally occurring isotopes. So we would use our formula that we just talked about, which is basically what's on the bottom. The atomic mass would equal the percentage of the first isotope in converted to a decimal. So you could do it one of two ways, either divide it by 100 or move the decimal two places to the left. I'm just going to move the decimal on this one. So this would be 0 0.9897, which is 98% converted into a decimal, times in it by the atomic mass of our first isotope. And then the important thing where people mess up is you're actually going to add here, not multiply or anything like that. And you're going to take the percentage of our next isotope, which is 1.11%. Take 1.11 divided by 100, or move the decimal, you get 0 0.0111, which would be 1.11% times our mass of our second isotope, which was 13.003 AMU. And as you see there, you should end up with something close to what they got there, 0.9897 times 12 plus 0 0.0111 times 13.003. I personally get when I punch into my calculator 12.02 AMU, which is pretty close to what you see on the periodic table of 12.01, which is what they got going on down here. The difference is really this number is rounded a little bit. Um, there's a couple more zeros, I think, in there and stuff like that. So 
Um, but you do get 12.01 basically or 12.02 AMU, which would be the atomic mass of this guy. It's important to remember that although this is the number that we do see on the periodic table, the 12.01, uh, you will never find a carbon atom that has a mass of 12.01. You will either find one that has the mass of carbon 12, which is 12, or you'll find one that has the mass of carbon 13, which is the 13.003. Again, what we see on the periodic table is average atomic masses, and in most cases, we just call it the atomic mass, um, but it technically is an average value of all the naturally occurring isotopes. Question on that calculation there. So why don't you try one here? We have two isotopes of bromine, bromine 79 and bromine 81, 50.7% uh, and 49.32%. The atomic masses of each of those uh, 78.92 for bromine 79 and 80.92 for bromine 81. What is the average atomic mass here? And I'm assuming the right answer hopefully should be there. So take a minute or two and see which one you come up with. And then we'll talk about it. <clears throat> That's a, that's a good question about the significant figures. Technically speaking, uh, you, you should, um, you should probably follow the sync fig rules. I will say though that uh, usually with uh, something like atomic mass or something like that, they oftentimes will just in the problem sometimes tell you to do it to either like uh, four significant figures sometimes. They will sometimes tell you that in the problem or maybe two decimal places. So. I would say more so than a lot of other problems when you do a problem like this, they sometimes will give you some of that extra insight. If they don't give you the insight to like take it to two decimal places or four sig figs, uh, you could just follow the normal sort of uh, sig fig rules when you're doing it. So I see some answers coming in, they're looking good. So let's take a look here. Again, when you are given the percentage, these are again the relative abundance or percent abundance of each of these isotopes. And again, you just wanna make sure that uh, you just quickly kind of look at the percentages and make sure that you're near 100%. So in this case, when you add up both of those percentages, you're about 100.02, something like that. So you know you're not missing any isotopes. If you happen to add up these percentages and you're missing, not 100%, uh, you probably will have some type of other information you need to use you know, to figure it out. 
Uh, so what we basically need to do is just follow our little uh, kind of formula there. So our atomic mass would be our first isotope. And again here, I'm going to move the decimal. So that's going to be 0 0.5070, which is our 50.7% converted into a decimal, times in it by the atomic mass of our first isotope. Again, we're going to add it. We're going to take the percentage of the next one if you want. An alternative to that is you could just go 49.32 and divide it by 100%. And again, that will move the decimal for you for the percentage part of it. Uh, times our 80.92 AMU. And again, uh, you could do it that way or move the decimal. And when you're done, I agree with you, you do get 79.92 AMU. And that also is the number that you should kind of see on the periodic table, pretty close to it. So it does look like it is D as a winner in that particular case. Any questions on how to calculate uh, our atomic mass? Again here, um, if you sort of follow the sig fig rules, you would take 0 0.5070 times 78.92. And technically speaking, if you just did this part of it, you should go to four significant figures, which would give you 40.01 AMU. And if you did the same thing on this guy, you would get uh, four sig figs, which would be 3991. And now you would add those together, which means you technically should go to two decimal places, and that's exactly what we did here. So that's essentially how you get there, kind of to the two decimal places by following those sig fig rules. Again, technically speaking, the two things in parentheses, multiplication. So we look at sig figs, which gave us two decimal places for each of those. And then when we add them, we should look at decimal places, should also give us two decimal places in that particular case. Any questions on atomic mass? And again, you need to know how to obviously calculate that there. So let's talk a little bit then about the periodic table. So hopefully you have one near you or in your book. You'll see it on the screen here. But this is the periodic table. It obviously is an arrangement of all the elements that we have. Uh, the periodic table really is broken up into sort of three categories, if you will. We have metals, which are typically this way. There's usually this sort of staircase thing that you can see on a lot of periodic tables kind of working its way down, uh, coming this way. To the kind of upper right of that staircase in this sort of region, we have non-metals. And right on that staircase is, as we will talk about, what are sometimes referred to as semi-metals. Our metalloids are those guys right there. So when we look at a periodic table, Going up and down on the periodic table, these are what are referred to as groups. It's really old, sometimes people will call it families, but not too much anymore, most people go with the groups. And if you look at the periodic table, depending on the periodic table you're looking at, just like this one, there's some different numbering that you'll see up there on top of the periodic table on each of the groups. Uh, so again, coming up and down is our group. And we use what is sometimes referred to as the representative numbering. Uh, we use the representative numbering or what is sometimes referred to as the A numbering. And in the A numbering, this is group one right here. And by the way, even though hydrogen is hanging out there, group one actually starts with lithium, not hydrogen. We'll talk about why that is in just a second. Right next door is group number two. Skipping everybody in the middle section here, group number three would be here, group number four, group number five, group number six, group number seven, and group number eight. It is technically 1A, 2A, 3A, 4A, 5A, all the way across, but most people, again, do not use the A numbering. And probably every chemistry class you take, everybody uses the A numbering, and it is just considered group one here, group two here. Group three over here where boron is, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and coming across there. Now, going left to right on the periodic table, these are what are known as periods. So periods head uh, that away, yes, on the periodic table. And if you look at some periodic tables, you'll actually see some numbering. Uh, you can see right here, that's P2, 
period one, again, going left to right, hydrogen to helium, period two, period three, period four, again, all the periods heading left to right on the periodic table as you go across it. And some of the stuff that we've talked about already here, the number above the symbols is our atomic number, which again is our number of protons that there are in a particular atom in an, in an element. Some other important parts of the uh, periodic table here is metals, nonmetals, and metalloids. So as I mentioned before, it is essentially broken up like that. And as you can see on the last periodic table and some periodic tables, uh, it depends, this guy right here. But again, usually to the left of the staircase and also those guys on the bottom of the last one, there's two rows on the bottom, there are also metals. Metals are good conductors of heat and electricity. They also uh, have good malleability. You can hammer them into sheets. You can pull them into wires. Metals typically are very shiny. Pretty much all metals are solids at room temperature. The only exception is mercury. Mercury is a, a liquid at room temperature. And why on a lot of periodic tables, sometimes you'll see mercury, which is HG, uh, almost a different color in terms of its, its letters and stuff like that. Uh, so on this periodic table here, mercury would be somewhere in that ballpark, right about there. And mercury is, again, a liquid at room temperature. All the other metals are pretty much solids at room temperatures. Nonmetals, as you can see, to the upper right of the staircase. And our staircase here is our semi-metals or metalloids. And the reason I mentioned before why this is lithium right here, that is hydrogen, and that's like helium and so forth. The reason I mentioned before when we talked about group one, starting with lithium and not hydrogen, what we see here is hydrogen is actually a non-metal. Even though on the periodic table, it's hanging out with the metals on the left, Older periodic tables, hydrogen used to be found sometimes on both sides. You would actually see hydrogen on the left and the right-hand side of the periodic table. Most don't do that anymore. Um, but hydrogen is actually a non-metal, which is why when we talk about group one, it starts with lithium and not hydrogen. And we'll see a little bit more why that is in a second as well. Now, non-metals have pretty much the opposite characteristics of metals. Uh, they're usually bad conductors of heat and electricity. Um, also very different is that they have usually different properties. Uh, a lot of nonmetals are gases uh, like O2, N2, Cl2, F2, B. Um, these are all gases, H2. Uh, bromine, for example, Br2 is a liquid. And a lot of those nonmetals are those diatomic molecules that we talked about there in chapter one, I think it was. Uh, carbon, sulfur, or solids. They're usually dull and brittle. And again, our nonmetals are found upright of the periodic table is typically where we find those guys. Now our metalloids are semi-metals just for a cross comparison. And again, some books, and I think your book might include boron as part of it, which is right here. Some books don't um, as a metalloid, but I think yours might include boron. And it's basically the staircase that kind of comes down, you know, in twos for the most part here. It's almost that dividing line, if you will, between metals and non-metals uh, in terms of uh, the periodic table. So metalloids, uh, which most people call them now metalloids, some people still call them semi-metals, but most people call them metalloids. So semi-metals are metalloids talking about the same guys. Uh, these are elements that basically have properties that can be considered kind of on both sides of the fence. So since they kind of sit between metals and non-metals, the individual metalloid has some properties that are very much like metal properties. And the metalloid has some properties that are very similar to non-metal properties. So the same element has properties that really fall on both sides. They're sometimes referred to as semiconductors, some of those guys in that um, area of the periodic table. Now, in addition, the periodic table, there are certain groups that have special names and you do need to know those. So group one is our alkali metals. 
Yeah, you could consider uh, you could consider boron kind of a non-metal. It's almost treated like a non-metal, really, uh, more so than a metalloid in most books. So uh, you could do it either one. We probably won't come across, honestly, boron too much in here. Um, I just don't remember off the top of my head if your book considers it on the periodic table as a metalloid or, or just a non-metal. But um, I, I've taught with books that kind of do both. So if you want for you could consider really more on more of a non-metal a lot of the way it's named a lot of sort of its bonding characteristics are oftentimes more sort of thought of as being non-metal like and stuff like that so that's okay so group one is our alkali metals uh and again it starts with lithium group one again even though hydrogen is sitting here it is not a member of group one again because hydrogen is a non-metal So uh, group two, which is right next door, is the alkaline earth metals. So yeah, for our purposes, you can consider boron a non-metal. That's fine. Um, the alkaline earth metals are right next door. So that's your beryllium, your magnesium, your calcium, uh, your strontium, and all these guys here. Coming all the way over here to group seven. Group seven is our halogen. So that's your fluorine, your chlorine, your bromine, your iodine. These are a lot of those guys that how they naturally come as twos, F2, Cl2, Br2, I2. Um, and that's group seven. Now, when we talk about alkaline and alkali metals, which are over here, these guys uh, basically alkaline means basic is what alkaline means. And that's where a lot of like strong bases come from, things like sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, calcium hydroxide, strontium hydroxide. These are where a lot of bases actually come from. And that's really what alkaline means. And lastly, on group number eight is the noble gases. Nobody really calls them rare gases anymore. These are the noble gases. Noble means basically a group set apart they are sometimes what are referred to as being chemically inert, which means they are not very reactive. They don't react with other things. They react with themselves, but not other things. And that's like noble gases. There's also some things that are noble metals like gold and silver and platinum uh, right around here are noble metals. It's not really a group or anything like that, but there are some noble metals and, and sort of that range. They're also very unreactive. So a metal like gold is sometimes referred to as a noble metal uh, because of that, it's not very reactive at all. Uh, but group number eight is our noble gases. So again, group one, starting with lithium is alkali metals, beryllium, magnesium, and calcium coming down that group is our alkaline earth metals. Group seven is our halogens and group eight is our noble gases. Again, you do need to know the location of those guys on the periodic table and uh, be able to find them. Now between group number two right here and group number three right here, we have our transition metals. So that's these guys here really from here to here and up on both sides, as you can see here. So those are our transition metals in that region. Transition metals, as we'll talk about in the next chapter, one thing that they have uh, is basically a variable type charge. And what that means is when they do gain a charge, they have the ability to gain multiple types of charges. So something like iron, for example, can in certain cases be iron with a plus two. And in other cases, it could be iron with a plus three charge. So it has that sort of ability to make a variable type charge. Now there are, uh, those are our transition metals, by the way. There are two rows on the bottom here, this guy and this guy. And these guys are what are known as the lanthanides and actinides. And actually, if you look at the periodic table and you look at the numbering, this is 57 and this is 72. That's a pretty big jump. So there should be something that goes right there. And what goes right there is right here, that's 58. So this row that's sort of yellow technically goes right there. Well, if you look at down here, this guy's 89, and then we jump to 104. So usually 90 comes after that. And technically this row here goes right about there on the periodic table. So those two bottom rows that you commonly see on periodic tables, technically if you follow the atomic numbers, should go right about there. But if they put it in there, then your periodic table is like super wide. 
And I've only ever in my life seen one periodic table like that. And they put it on a big wall in their classroom and it took up the entire wall because they separated out those two rows where they normally go and the periodic table became super wide. And they are called the lanthanides and actinides because technically those are the elements that they should follow. They are also sometimes referred to those two guys on the bottom as inner transition metals because technically speaking, right here where I kind of drew this line, that's the transition metals and technically they go right there inside the transition metal region. So they're sometimes referred to as the inner transition metals. The good news for us is since we really don't do too much with any type of radioactive or radioactivity or lectures on that, um, a lot of these guys down here are radioactive. This is also where you find a lot of those man-made guys like Einsteinium and Nobelium and all those kind of guys down in that region. But uranium is probably the only element maybe that you'll, you'll probably come across uh, in this class in terms of naming. So again, U is uranium and that's again a common one that you might come across as well. Any question on the periodic table? So you need to know which way groups go on the periodic table. You need to know the numbering of the groups, one through eight. You need to know which way periods go on the periodic table. You need to know where metals, nonmetals, and metalloids are found. You need to know the names of those special groups, the alkali metals, alkaline earth metals, halogens, and noble gases. You need to know where the transition metals are also found. Any questions on the periodic table? Again, a periodic table will be provided for you for any type of quiz or exam that you need a periodic table for. And it will look something like this one here. The only additional thing that will be on there is the atomic mass, the number on the bottom. So the number on the bottom will be there. It will not have any element names on it or anything like that, but those numbers on the bottom will be there, which is the atomic mass that we just talked about. Okay, so if there's no question on the periodic table, we're then going to talk about really right now electrons and sort of where electrons are in the atom, uh, what is sometimes referred to as electron configuration, where they go, how they fit in, and all that kind of stuff. So to help us sort of maybe understand some of it about electrons is when we talked about electrons and a lot of properties involving electrons involve when electrons really transition from different energy levels. And as electrons transition from energy levels, sometimes energy is given off. So for example, if an electron was higher in energy and it wanted to come back down to a lower state of energy, it has to give off that energy. And oftentimes that's given off in the form of a wave. So a wave is sometimes given off in terms of that energy. The wave has what is known as lambda, that is the wavelength. And depending on sort of the wavelength, it may fall somewhere here in what is known as the electromagnetic spectrum. An electromagnetic spectrum is this whole thing here. And there's different parts of it. For example, here's radio waves, like when you would listen to the radio. Here's microwaves, when you heat up your food. Infrared is like heat. This is the visible part of the spectrum. This is where we see color. That's that famous Roy G. Biv, right? I guess I can put my G closer to that area, but our red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, uh, ultraviolet, right? X-rays and gamma rays. And sort of the relationship between waves and energy is the longer the wavelength, the lower the energy, and the shorter the wavelength, the higher the energy. So over here, this is the wavelength. This is 10 to the four on this side. This is 10 to the minus 12 in terms of the wavelength. 10 to the minus 12 means 11 places to the left with all kinds of zeros. So on the left-hand side of the spectrum, we have a very small wavelength. On the right-hand side, we have a longer wavelength. So in terms of energy, this is definitely higher in energy on this side and lower in energy over here. And even our colors that we see, this is lower in energy in terms of colors. This would be higher in energy this way. So as we go from radio waves to microwaves, we get a little bit more energy, enough to spin water really fast, right? Your pizza cooks in like two minutes. Infrared is where we feel heat. 
visible part of the spectrum. Ultraviolet, right? That's why we put sunblock on when we go outside so we don't get too burnt. X-rays, that's why they throw a lead vest on you, right? And leave the room when they shoot the X-rays. <clears throat> and gamma rays is really just pure radio radiation, basically. It's very high in energy. And uh, so as electrons transition, you know, it may give off a wavelength of energy that corresponds somewhere here. This is also the same idea about fireworks, right? So when they explode fireworks, when it explodes, those elements that are in the fireworks gain a whole bunch of energy. What ends up happening is those electrons go to a higher energy state. They work their way back down. And as they're given off energy, those wavelengths fall in the visible part of the spectrum. So we go, oh, pretty red color, pretty blue color, pretty some other color that basically happens when those sort of fireworks explode. So when we talk about electrons in different states, uh, there's a couple of numbers that we talk about, and one's the principal quantum number, and that's what N is. N is the symbol for what is referred to as the principal quantum number. And really that is just a fancy word for energy level. So when we talk about the N value or the principal quantum number, that's just a fancy way of saying that is the energy level at which we find these electrons. N could have values of one through seven. And if it is N is equal to one, that is what is referred to as the ground state or the ground level. And what that means is that is the lowest in energy you could have in terms of electrons where they could be. It's also the closest to the nucleus. So your N equals one is your ground state. It is the most stable orbit you could have or orbital you could have. And the idea is, and again, in terms of energy as well, that the lower the energy, the more stable something is. If something's really high in energy, it's very unstable. It doesn't really like to be high in energy. And that's really why those electrons, for example, in fireworks or something like that, when it explodes, all those electrons go to the really high energy levels and they really don't want to be there. So they work their way back down to a lower state of energy. And like I said, depending on how much energy they need to give off as to what colors you might see that corresponds to. Anything above N equals one, N equals two, three, four, all the way to seven, these are what are sometimes referred to as excited states of energy. And these are higher in energy. They are also further away from the nucleus. So an electron in the seventh energy level is way farther in energy, our distance, from an electron that's like in the first energy level, which is closer uh, to the nucleus. And where we actually do find electrons in an atom are what are referred to as orbitals. And that's what these are. So these are orbitals. And what are orbitals? Orbitals are really sort of theoretical areas in an atom as to where we would expect to find an electron. So earlier, and we don't get into a great amount of detail on this, so I'm just gonna kind of give you the cliff note version of this, but earlier we talked about the idea that electrons in an atom really don't move in these pretty little circles, you know, around and around. Sometimes it was referred to as the Bohr model of the atom or the planetary model of the atom where these electrons are in these orbits and they're circling and circling the nucleus electrons really do move pretty randomly about the atom. Uh, there's no really good way to know exactly where an electron is at any given moment in time or know how it got there. The best you could do is say, I think there's a pretty good probability of finding an electron in this location of an atom. And what we would imagine is because the nucleus is positively charged, there's a pretty good idea of finding an electron near the nucleus, right? Because Electrons are negatively charged, nucleus is positively charged, so there is gonna be that attraction. So really what these orbitals are, are really probability maps. A high probability of finding electrons somewhere in the atom, and these are sort of the visual representation of those probability maps. Uh, so for example, you could visualize like the nucleus is somewhere here, so there's probably a pretty good chance or a high probability of finding an electron in this area of it, as you sort of fan out this way, maybe not too much, or think about the nucleus being kind of here. Again, good probability to find an electron in this area, but it gets lighter and lighter as you sort of fan out from it. 
So as you can see here, there are four different types of orbitals where we find electrons. And let's talk about a couple of important things about electrons and how they are in the atom. First off, when we have an electron, we could represent them with arrows. So we could represent them with arrows, if you will. And any individual orbital. So any individual orbital that you have, we'll represent that with a line, could only hold a maximum of two electrons. So the maximum number of electrons that you can put in any orbital that you have, you just have one individual orbital, be it an S orbital, P orbital, D orbital, an F orbital, you can only put a maximum of two electrons in there. So these are the four different types. There's S orbitals, which as you can see, look like a sphere. There's P orbitals, which look like kind of figure eight. There's D orbitals, which look like we threw two P orbitals together. And there's F orbitals, which look like we threw two D orbitals basically together in most cases. Now, when we talk about S orbitals, there is only one type of S orbital, which means if you max out the S orbital, you can only put in there a maximum of two electrons. So two electrons if you max it out. When we get to the p orbitals, there's actually three different types of p orbitals. There is a px, a py, and a pz orbital. And what this represents is like a math, right? There's an x, y, and z plane. One in three-dimensional space is on the x, one's on the y, and one's on the z axis, if you will very badly drawn there, but hopefully you get the idea. And because there's three different types of P orbitals, if you max out the P orbitals, you could put a grand total of six electrons total in there, two in each of them, right? So two, two, and two electrons you could put in there. And that is a maximum of six electrons. When we get to the d orbitals, there's actually five different types of d orbitals. dxy, dyz, dx squared, y squared, and so forth. Not important for us, the actual symbols of them, but there's basically five different types of d orbitals that you could put electrons in in an atom. And because there's five different types, and if each one could hold a maximum of two electrons, if you max out the d orbitals, you could throw in there a maximum of five times two is 10 electrons total. And lastly, here are f orbitals. There is actually seven different f orbitals, which again means that if each individual f orbital could hold two electrons, and there's seven of them, you can max out the f orbitals by putting 14 electrons in there. So in terms of electron configuration, which is really where we're going with this in terms of writing electron configuration, figuring out where things are, this is extremely important. S orbital, you can max out with two. There's three different types of p orbitals. If you max them all out, you got six electrons. Five different types of d orbitals, you got 10 electrons and 14 electrons in the seven different types of f orbitals. Any questions on that so far? Again, for our purposes, you don't have to worry about sort of the, the shape of each of these or anything like that, but you do need to know how many different types there are of those types of orbitals and how many total electrons if you max out everybody that is there. And again, this is sort of a, a diagram of what an S orbital looks like, a P orbital. And like I say, you could kind of envision the nucleus in the center. Again, higher probability towards the center as you fan out from there, lower probability. Here's our uh, P orbitals. And again, much prettier picture. But again, you can see this is on the X, this is on the Y, and you have one on the Z. Again, each of these individually can hold two electrons for two, four, and six electrons. 
if you fill them all up together, our total. So uh, I don't know if I have a, any type of link to learn more about those, but there should be a little bit more in, in your textbook. And for our purposes um, in this class, you don't necessarily have to uh, know more than sort of what they are and sort of how many electrons it can hold. So what we're sort of looking at is in terms of energy, what this sort of means is, let me go with, uh, let me go here is good. So for example, if we did, this was energy here. If we were on the n equals one, the only the only orbital that would be there would be what is referred to as a one s orbital. The one means it's on the first energy level. The s means that's the type of orbital that's sitting there. If we go to the second energy level, there is also an s orbital, and that is where we first start to see the p orbitals come in, which are referred to as two p's. So the 2s and the 2p there represents the energy level it's on. If we go to the n equals 3 level, you will also find an s orbital. You will find a p orbitals, which are known as 3p orbitals. And that is where we first start to see the d orbitals occur. You go to the next energy level, which is the fourth energy level. You will see a 4s orbital. You will surprisingly see a 4p orbital. You will also see a 4d orbital. And this is where we first start to see a 4f orbital occur over there. Now, how electrons go in is remember that the n equals 1 is the lowest in energy. So when electrons go in, they go into here. They do go one up and actually one down. And that has something to do with something outside of our class as well. But this is what is referred to as the spin. Electrons have a spin. And when they go into the orbital, this is what is known as positive a half spin. And the other one goes in the opposite way, which is known as minus one half in terms of a spin. And you don't have to worry about the minus half or plus one half but that's what is sometimes what is referred to. And that's how they usually go in. As you can see here, what happens is at this point, all the electrons are filled. I can't put any more here. If I had more electrons, it needs to go to the next lowest in energy, which would go here. And then it would have to fill up this guy and continue on in that pattern until you know you've filled up all the electrons. So the electrons essentially go in lowest energy to highest. And why we're here, let's talk about a couple terminology uh, that we oftentimes will hear. First off, for example, if I wanted to know the maximum number of electrons, if I filled the n equals two, and it's sometimes referred to as level, our shell. So these are two words that sometimes come up. So when we talk about the n equals two level or shell, what we are talking about, if we go to our little diagram, is every single orbital that is on this entire level. So if I look at this, I have an s orbital, I have three p orbitals here. And if I did that, that means if I max this out, this would be two, four, six, eight electrons if I filled it up completely. Now, if I was asked a similar type of question where it says, what is the maximum number of electrons on the 2p subshell? How many electrons would that be, you think? Take a second and think about what you think it would be. If I filled up, the 2p subshell, how many maximum number of electrons could I put in there? And hopefully what you might figure out is 2p is here. The 2p subshell would be just these guys. What is the 2p subshell? It is a grand total of two, four, and six electrons, or three subshells, and that would be three electrons. 
This is sometimes what is referred to as a subshell or a sub level. Now let's go with the bonus question here is how many electrons maximally can I put in a 3D orbital? So take a second and think about how many electrons could you max out in a 3D orbital? And the answer would be two electrons. So you may say to yourself, isn't this entire thing the 3D orbital? And the answer is no, that entire thing is the 3D subshell or sub level. A 3D orbital may be this orbital, maybe this orbital, maybe that one, maybe that one, maybe that one. But as we talked about, no matter what it is, any individual orbital can only hold a maximum of two electrons. That's like the trick question on these things. Usually in their lab manual, there's a trick question like that. Or I won't say trick question, but there's a question like that. So if I said how many electrons in the 3D subshell, the answer would be what I see in the box there. It would be 10 in that case because all these guys would be filled up. Now, so shell or level means every orbital on a particular n equals something number. A subshell or sublevel is an individual set of orbitals, like this would be the 4D subshell. And an orbital is one individual orbital by itself. Any questions on that so far? It's probably a good place to stop for today in terms of lecture. Any questions? Okay, a couple of reminders before half of you take off. Uh, Remember that uh, you do have that practice uh, proctorial quiz. If you haven't done it, you need to wrap that out by tonight. It is worth some points. Also a reminder that we are having a quiz on Wednesday uh, on chapter, that's chapter one in this class, I think, chapter one. And uh, again, a reminder that uh, we will take it on Canvas. We are going to use the proctorial, I think, for this quiz. So make sure that you take that and you got that all set up. And the plan right now is I think we will have lecture like normal and we will stop a little bit early so uh, you know we'll probably stop just a little bit after six or so on Wednesday and then you could go and take the quiz at that point so that should hopefully give you enough time to knock out the quiz and get to lab and or back to discussion one of those two things so uh, I think that's how we will do it any questions on that Okay, so again, uh, you will be provided a periodic table if you need it. I don't know if you'll need it, but you'll be provided one if you do. And I think you'll probably be provided some conversions on this. The only thing that you might not be provided for sure is, again, any type of formulas. So I think that might just be density. It is on chapter one, yeah. So I think the formula should be density. Truthfully, I don't know yet. It's not Wednesday, so I haven't written it yet, but soon it should be up there. I'm not sure. Uh, you do get to use a calculator. Uh, you'll get to use a calculator, and like I said, uh, You'll be given some conversions, but you will not be given temperature conversions. So you do need to know how to do the temperature conversions and you will not be given any formulas like, you know, D equals M over V or anything like that. Okay. But you can use a quiz on all, you can't use a quiz on everything. You use a calculator on all quizzes and exams and stuff like that, obviously. And like I said, anything that you need a periodic table, will, one will be provided for you. Any other questions on any of that? So the plan is we'll do a little bit of lecture and we'll stop lecturing a little bit early and you can use the rest of lecture time to take the quiz and all that. And then you could go off to wherever you need to go on Wednesday. All right, if there's no other question, you will not be given formulas. No, you do need to know formulas. So like I said, I think you just have density in there and uh, you do need to know how the formulas to convert temperature. Those will not be provided for you. Okay, if there's no other questions, please make sure you put here in the, uh, you're welcome. And please put here in the chat box if you didn't do so, then if you're off the lab, have a good lab. If you're off for discussion, we'll start in about five or so minutes and make sure you come through to the discussion uh, link.